Hello, everybody. So, uh, continuing on with our topics, uh, the next one is fire and physical environment interaction. So, specifically focusing on soil and water quite a bit, and then talking a little bit about air and how fire affects air quality. So, let's get started. Uh, in terms of soil, soil is a primary factor in productivity in an ecosystem, and fire uh, does have the ability to both enhance and degrade soil quality. With water, water is an excellent indicator of ecosystem condition, um, but fire can affect water quantity and quality in aquatic uh, riparian ecosystems and can have a really, um, really damaging effect for, for, the, um, for the riparian and aquatic ecosystems. In terms of air, smoke is what we're really talking about in smoke. Uh, is definitely going to impact air quality. It's going to affect human health and welfare. It's going to contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, and it's going to affect uh, visibility, which uh, those of us in California who have lived here a while, and especially in the Central Valley, have uh, kind of uh, had to experience that in the, the really the worst parts of it. In terms of soils, um, so soils, kind of the five things that affect soils in the way that they're formed are geology, topography, climate, organisms, and time. And soils themselves are a combination of weathering rock and incorporation of organic material. Uh, the big thing for why we want to look at soils in terms of its relationship to fire is that it's a dynamic medium that is sensitive to ecosystem change. Well, what does that mean? Well, uh, it's a place that allows for plants to grow, but it's very sensitive to the changes in the ecosystem into how those plants will grow and kind of the how the nutrients flow uh, from the plants and to the plants. And so it's really important that your soil is healthy so that the rest of your ecosystem is healthy. In terms of water, or uh, really when we're talking about water, we're talking about hydrology, hydrology being the cyclic movement of water through the landscape. Um, what are all the things we're talking about? We're talking about precipitation, we're talking about runoff uh, or flow, groundwater, so that's through infiltration, the water going into the soil and then um, going into the into the aquifer, uh, or just soil water where it just sits in the soil. And then we're also talking about evaporation and transpiration, or when you combine, combine the two, evapotranspiration, evaporation being... Um, the water just turning, um, it just evaporating back into the atmosphere uh, and transpiration, whereas the plant's using the water and then it uh, going back up into the atmosphere. Uh, fire is going to change the water balance at a site. And um, the biggest thing is it's going to enhance runoff at the expense of percolation. So rather than water getting into the system, we're going to be experiencing a lot more surface runoff than we will in terms of this infiltration because of a lack of vegetation for the most part. In terms of air, we're really talking about smoke emissions. So smoke emissions can affect human health, um, the planetary energy balance, and visibility, but it's going to depend on many factors, lots and lots of different factors. Smoke is a complex mixture of different gases and particles that are produced during combustion and because um, because we get incomplete combustion and sometimes we get full combustion, sometimes we get incomplete combustion, sometimes we get little combustion, sometimes we get a lot of combustion. It's going to be a different mixture of gases. It's going to be a different way that smoke can affect. There's a lot of uh, different um, pieces to the puzzle when it comes to smoke emissions. Um, Especially here in California, management of smoke is an important aspect of fire management um, because, uh, particularly because of the effects of smoke on human health and then visibility. And one of the, the biggest things um, or, or kind of uh, biggest differences that separates this air portion um, as compared to the soil and water quality is that um, the smoke, smoke can have far-ranging effects. So because depending on the winds and what's going on with the weather during that day, you can have it to where the smoke could affect areas hundreds of miles away. 
we've seen it where you've got fires in northern california or you've got fires up in the sierras or you've got fires um on um inland or on the coast and then all of a sudden you get the weather to change and now you know the central valley is all smoked out or the napa valleys all smoked out or you get it where san francisco is all smoked out because of fires happening uh in in places that are miles away so it's really interesting in terms of the idea that you can get these far-reaching effects and end up with scenery like this where you got the decreased visibility you got the potential hazard to human health even when the fire isn't burning right there the fire is miles away but it just it depends on the weather and a lot of different factors as to um, how smoke can affect an area. So let's talk about fire interactions with soil. So there's positive and negative responses to burning. And it's and you can see this directly in soil fertility, in nutrient availability, in organic matter content, in the water infiltration, and in soil mineralogy and color. And we're going to kind of talk about a few of those in detail. Uh, in terms of indirect changes, you can see that in microbial processes and the loss of nutrients uh, to erosion. And then, of course, with a lot of these things, you're going to get, um, it's going to differ based on the, the fire temperature, the intensity of the fire, the duration of the fire, the frequency, the season of occurrence, and, and topographical location. So basically, all the different aspects of fire that um, that make a fire burn differently are going to change the way that it's going to interact with the soil so let's uh, we'll talk about soil physical properties and then we're going to talk about soil chemical properties so we'll start with the physical properties so let's go with soil heating first so less heat is produced in the soil in a fast moving fire as can Compared to a slow moving backing fire. So if we're not comfortable with the terminology of a backing fire, a backing fire means a fire that's going against the wind and that usually is just, um, it, that's usually going to be a fire that's going to be moving much slower because a wind driven fire gets that extra push of oxygen. It's easy to move from fuel to fuel whereas a backing fire when you're going against the wind but you're still um, moving forward that's going to make it much harder to go fast. And so less heat is actually produced in the soil in a fast-moving fire as compared to a slow-moving fire. And that's just due to the idea of um, the idea that residence time is extremely important when it comes to the soil. soil. If you've got a fire that's going to just sit there and sit on top of an area, like you say, you get a log that's going to hold a lot of heat and it's going to just sit on one area and not move that's going to burn down into the soil. Now that's going to be problematic because that will it's got the time to sit there and work its way through the soil. But when it's a fast moving fire, it will it'll burn off the surface. It may scorch everything. It may kill everything on the surface. But it's really not going to have that much effect into the soil because it just isn't going to be able to travel that far downwards. Most of the heat from a wildfire travels upwards, right? Just go back to the basic physics that we know. Heat rises. And so the majority of the heat is going to go up. It's usually less than 10% of the heat from a fire that goes down into the soil. Um, so the question gets asked, does wildfire sterilize soils? Does wildfires, when they um, kill everything on the surface, do they, does wildfire prevent living organisms? No, it doesn't. Uh, the recolonization of soils will happen through microorganisms. Heat doesn't travel well uh, down soil due to soil being porous. So it's, it's, got, it's got huge pores, and those pores are filled with water and air. And so because of that heat, it doesn't transfer heat very well at all. Um, the exceptions being that example I gave of the log, the exceptions being long durations in an area, and then also compaction to where you don't have the big, huge pores. You've got smaller pores because everything's been compacted and tightened together. Most of the soil out like this, lots of space, 
doesn't really conduct heat that well, but if everything's tight together, now it's much easier to conduct heat. And so um, another part of it being that organic matter, which we know makes up um, a small percentage of soils, but it's in there. Organic matter uh, holds water really well and does not conduct heat well. And so it's very hard for fire to actually tr get heat to travel downwards because it just doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. Soil is not made to, for fire to travel well through it, for heat to travel uh, downwards through soil. In terms of soil texture and structure, severely burned soils usually become coarser or, or harder, and it's due to a decrease in clay due to melting and fusion of the clay minerals. And, and because of that, um, that decrease in clay and the fusing of the clay minerals, you get harder soils. Um, in terms of the structure of our soils, fire consumes the organic matter and um, fungi usually. So this is going to reduce aggregation, it's going to increase bulk density, it's going to decrease porosity, and it's going to reduce infiltration. So if we're decreasing our porosity, um, our, our pores are going to be, are not going to um, be able to absorb things. So saying that another way, if we have low porosity, we don't have pore space. So um, if we have high porosity, plenty of space for air and for water. Low porosity, all the soils are, the soil um, grains are closer together which means that um, it's going to be easier for heat to travel through. It's also going to be harder for water and air to travel through, which gives us our reduced infiltration, which is also going to be um, problematic after fires. Let me get myself out of the woods. Here, I'll come over here. There we go. So soil color. Um, to me, I just find this interesting, and I, I picked a this picture of um, eucalyptus in Australia to hopefully kind of give you give you a little bit of that um, this idea. So mineral soil color is influenced by the type and amount of organic matter and iron oxides present. So if you get a low intensity burn, you're going to see black ash with scorched litter and duff. If you get moderate intensity burns, you're going to see most litter consumed uh, with gray and black ash. When you get a high intensity burn, you get white ash due to complete fuel combustion in, and you can get reddening of, of mineral soil. And so if we look at this picture over here on the right hand side of your screen, um, to me, I would say this was a moderate intensity burn. And I like the idea that I can just look at the soil color and be able to, to, um, to estimate that. Because if I look at that, I see some blackened areas, I see some gray areas, and I do see some some litter, but probably the majority of the litter being gone, which hits right into this moderate intensity section. Um, I'm sure if we looked around this whole area, we'd find pockets of white where it just, um, things got totally burned out, and then probably little pockets of, of black, um, specifically, I can look at this area right here and see that it's it's mostly black. So that area burned with a little bit more low intensity, whereas an area like this burned with a much more moderate intensity. And I'm sure if this were a bigger picture, we could look around more, you'd find an area of high intensity as well. Now, um, I couldn't find a good picture of it, but there's definitely, um, it's interesting when you see it, um, it's not great for the environment. But when you see it, this idea of the high intensity burns and the red meat of mineral soil, um, I couldn't find any, but we've had some, uh, there were some fires in the southeast when I was down there, and um, there were we saw actual pictures of the soil where we'd really call it like pink soil because it burned with such a high intensity through the area. Um, usually it's where um, fire could just sit and burn and burn and get super hot and then that soil would would literally be like a pinkish color which is that reddening of the of the mineral soil and it's it was just an interesting phenomenon to to experience okay soil water repellency 
So um, what can happen is that um, with with uh, or post fire, you can get a hydrophobic coating on soils where the soils just will not allow for water penetration. So this is a close up photo of some soil with water droplets just sitting on the ground, which we know by the way soil works. If any of us have ever just had watched sprinklers on a garden or anything like that, right? The water hits the ground, some water sinks in, some water doesn't. But this water is just sitting there and it's got no place to go. Um, most wildfires will produce a mosaic of non, low, moderate, and high repellency soils across the landscape. So you're going to get areas um, kind of similar to when you're um, just uh, watering your lawn just because of other things probably happening um, in your lawn where you get areas where um, the fire didn't really do anything, so it's fine. Um, but you got some some low um, low repellency where most of the water's going in, some moderate repellency, some of the water's get, going in, some of the water's just sitting there, and then high repellency where you got whole areas where the water just is not going in at all. And that goes back to what we discussed: the idea of the of the low porosity and the reduced infiltration. And then um, you get this hydrophobic coating on the soil as well. And it can be really problematic in terms of water erosion uh, problems, which we're going to discuss later. And so here's just kind of a, a figure uh, illustrating this. So figure one illustrates the effects of fire intensity on above ground, ground vegetation and below ground soil properties. So if we look at during the fire, we get our fire intensity. We've got our heat. We've got our organic uh, litter that's getting burned off and then our conductive and radiant heat going down into the soil. And you can see, by the way, that um, that this drawing is made. And yes, I understand it's just a drawing, but notice we're not going very deep into the soil, right? We're, we're burning off the A horizon, which is spelled wrong. and It's not my picture, so, you know, it's, it's okay. Spelling mistakes every once in a while. Um, but we're not going very deep. We're just burning off that A the O and the uh, burning off the O horizon and then burning some of the A horizon. And then how how does that transfer to soil burn severity? Well, if you get um, some of these water repellent layers, because remember we said it'd be a mosaic. So here, the water's going to go into the soil just fine. But right here, we got a water repellent layer here. And here, we got a water repellent layer where that water is just going to sit or it's going to flow with gravity towards the lowest point which is how we end up getting erosion and overland flow or surface runoff to where we start having problems um, with uh, sediment transport and with um, erosion happening in these areas uh, post fire um, most notably in my mind was uh, Santa Barbara a few years back after after the big fires there where you know just hillsides were disappearing because they had huge rains and they had nothing to stop the um, hillsides from going anywhere and the water had no place to go because of um, the the reduced porosity the reduced infiltration and um, some water some hydrophobic coating on the soils slide myself over here Soil chemical properties. So that so we covered all the physical properties. So let's um, cover some of the chemical properties as well. In terms of the direct effect of fire on soil chemical properties, you get an oxidation of litter and organic horizons. That's going to lead uh, to increased mineral mineral mobility, and this is um, due to the idea of ash. So ash. Uh, instead of having litter, you have ash. So the idea um, with uh, fire taking the role of decomposition, which we've discussed in previous lectures, we, we've said that decomposition doesn't happen at a quick rate uh, here in California. But if you get a fire, it does because all that litter and duff and those, those things that were going to sit there for years and years and years, now all of a sudden is all ash. And once that once it's broken down into that ash form, it can the minerals within uh, that that ash can get into the soil much quicker now. 
Um, you also get heat induced change in microflora and you also get nutrient volatile volatilization. So that, um, that's basically where in the idea of the litter and the duff, um, those, those, um, layers being consumed. And so those nutrients, um, are now, um, volatilized and made available. But what's interesting is not all, not all of the, um, and, and specifically we're going to focus on nitrogen here. Um, not all of the nitrogen um, is going to be uh, in the soil. So on the right hand side here, I, I just kind of put the nitrogen cycle in soil. And so we need some sort of nitrogen fixation. So some sort of way that nitrogen is made available um, from this atmospheric nitrogen to be organic nitrogen that can then be used by the soil. So what happens in a fire is that the, you get nitrogen fixation happening through this nutrient volatilization. So you end up getting um, available nitrogen. But what's going to happen, though, is that it's not always going to make it into the soil because it may be transported through um, erosion or um, either by wind or water and transported off-site instead of making it into that area. So you actually get this... Um, this availability of nitrogen, but maybe not the um, direct effect of, of um, nitrogen that you might want in that specific area. And so in terms of organic matter, so uh, you've heard me say it a couple times, so litter and duff, and so if we're not quite familiar with litter and duff, when we say litter, so if you look at this picture here, so if you think about the forest floor and you think about leaves and um, twigs and little little things on the forest floor, if you know what they are, oh, look at all these leaves on the floor, if you look at all the, the twigs, the pine needles, that sort of stuff, that's going to be litter. Duff um, is when we're not quite sure. It, it's, there's something there. I don't, I can't tell you if it's leaf or, or pine needle or twig. But there's something there and then mineral soil is when you don't have those two layers that that those those two things that make up that organic layer on top um, your humus will be um, a, kind of a, the next level of, of duff um, in terms of litter and duff though they're extremely important to the health and productivity of rangelands uh, with organic matter, you're going to get an increase in soil carbon following fi fires. So you got ash and you got charcoal and you got partially burned organic material. It's all going to get incorporated into the soil now because it's um, in a much easier form um, with precipitation or something else for it to make its way into the soil because you don't have to wait years and years for this to become this and then get into the soil. It's all going to be kind of ready to go. Charcoal specifically can greatly improve soil productivity. So remember how we said um, said so, um, there's, we've got positive and negative benefits. It sounds like for the most part we've been talking about negative benefits, which we have, but there are positive benefits. So charcoal can greatly improve soil productivity because it's going to hold nutrients. It's going to improve water holding capacity in the soil, and it detoxifies uh, some compounds. The problem with that is that you get uh, less than 3% of um, organic matter uh, is is uh, charcoal. And so because it's uh, not a great amount of your organic matter, it's, it's still, it's a positive benefit, but it, there's a few more negatives. So in terms of nitrogen, uh, talked about this already, um, but Let's kind of go into a little more detail. So long periods of fire exclusion uh, can result in nitrogen limiting conditions in forests and rangelands. And so what's what's interesting to me about nitrogen post fire, let me slide myself out of the out of the green leaves there, is that you get so you get two changes in nitrogen after fire. So you get the loss of total nitrogen. So you get a bunch of nitrogen that gets burned up, and uh, the majority of that is just due to the loss of litter and duff. But you get the great increase in plant-available nitrogen. So there's another positive that happens uh, in terms of nitrogen, is that you get the, the great 
increase in plant available nitrogen. Uh, you get it in um, two ways. Just the idea that um, that you've got this littering duff that's been turned into um, a more available form uh, in the soil. But then you also get it because post-fire conditions favor um, pioneer species that are really good at nitrogen fixation. And so because those species come in and become early colonizers, um, they're going to work well with the microorganisms in the soil, and they're also going to make more nitrogen available. And so um, that's another that's another positive that you can get from from fire in terms of the soil. Uh, wildfire can also benefit areas that have too much pollution or too much nitrogen from urban pollution. So if a fire specifically burns near an urban area, lots lots of those areas actually have um, are getting nitrogen pollution um, from basically the atmospheric nitrogen coming from the urban areas, there's too much of it, and it can change the composition in an area and can um, favor uh, non-native, um, non exotic, invasive species. Um, but, but if we get a wildfire, that can kind of um, get rid of a lot of that because uh, we get that loss of total nitrogen, so we can get rid of a lot of that, um, that nitrogen that's available, and then um, so we can actually kind of reset the ecosystem a little bit, at least in those areas suffering from urban pollution. In terms of phosphorus, um, the majority of phosphorus is lost during um, volatilization of the litter in the biomass, just similar to nitrogen. So you burn up litter in biomass, you know, you burn up all this stuff right here, and then that's going to, you know, all this grass is gone, all of that top layer is gone, and then that's where you're going to lose your phosphorus, your nitrogen, and your potassium um, a little bit as well. But mostly uh, the nitrogen and the phosphorus is what's important. Slide myself out of the way over here. There we go. So um, C soil CEC or cation exchange capacity. So during combustion, you've got base cations are mineralized from surface fuels, leaving behind a nutrient-rich ash layer. So we we've, we've talked about the idea that um, that litter and duff and surface biomass, all that stuff, um, gets ate up by the fire, and what gets left in its place is ash, right? And so the key, though, is that that ash is a nutrient-rich ash layer, which we've also discussed you get precipitation that then leaches those nutrients into the soil and it provides a flush of, nu of nutrients for new growth. So the way cation exchange uh, works is that you need, um, you need this, uh, this soluble layer, um, which if we get a precipitation, that's, that's that soluble layer. So we get our, our, um, our cation exchange to happen within that soluble layer to go from our soil particles to the root hairs of the plants, and um, we can get those these different um, the the cations and the nutrients. It all comes together once we once we get um, fire to come through because the fire will speed up the decomposition process. Basically, we get that precipitation and we get nutrient rich ash into the soil quicker which allows for new growth. And so that's how, um, if you think about when we say that fire is kind of part of the ecosystem and how fire has a role in the ecosystem, fire is getting everything to kind of reset. And this is part of the ways in which fire is a good reset because it can get stimulate new growth by providing nutrients quicker. Um, fire is, fire is a, Flood risk, though, and this is going to be kind of um, our focus on fire's interaction with water is the idea of the erosion potential and the increase in water quantity um, that follows a fire. And so um, one of the ways that fire becomes problematic is the lack of interception. So when we're talking about interception, interception is the portion of rain or snow 
that is retained in the plant canopy. And I think it's really important for people to remember when we're talking about precipitation, it can be rain or snow. It's not one or the other. And so with interceptions, rain or snow that's retained in the plant canopy that's not um, sitting on the, on the surface of the soil. Um, interception reduces soil water storage because uh, in some places, um, you know, the soil can only hold so much water. It reduces raindrop impact, which is important in terms of erosion because it's really, um, it's really interesting the idea that you don't think about it that, you know, you just get one raindrop, but one raindrop because soil is so small, one raindrop can move quite a bit of, of soil and if you get a lot of raindrops in, in a quick amount of time you get a lot of soil moving and so it can reduce raindrop impact and then it also reduces um, transfer transpiration so the idea that um, that the uh, plant basically doesn't need to to sweat and to give off it doesn't need to give off water because it's it's using water because it's got water just sitting there on it so yeah so in terms of interception, it's important for the way that water um, moves through the ecosystem. Interception um, counts for about 11% in rangelands or, you know, a little bit over a tenth of the water in rangelands. And then it's about a quarter of the water in evergreen forests. Um, fire reduces interception and, incre and increases the amount of water on hillsides. Well, how does fire reduce interception? Well, pretty pretty simple right the the um, the biomass the whether they be trees sh uh, shrubs grasses right some of that's going to disappear it's not going to be there anymore it's not going to be there to intercept the water you know um, even if it's not a fire even if it's a low intensity fire we're still getting rid of all the stuff on the surface like the litter and the duff that would intercept um, some of that fire or some of that um, that precipitation uh, you, it, but even trees you know oh well it's not it didn't burn up the whole canopy or it didn't burn up the whole tree yeah but it got rid of some leaves and some branches so you still are getting a reduction in interception um, this will lead to an enhancement of snow depth for the most part um, being the idea that if there's nothing to catch the snow then every all the snow is just gonna pile up on the on the surface of the soil um, this could lead, though, because there's also nothing protecting the soil to more solar radiation, which could lead to more snow melt and actually a reduction in snow depth. So it could lead to more snow depth or it could be a reduction in snow depth. It just uh, depends. In terms of infiltration, um, infiltration might just be the most important hydrological change in post-fire environments. Um, and specifically, we're talking about the reduction in soil infiltration. Um, this mirrors the change in soil texture and porosity that we talked about because we have the, sm the, the low porosity, so small pores, everything close together, good for heat exchange, bad for water coming into the soil. And so infiltration can be reduced by loss of the litter and duff layer, which act like basically a sponge and have um, water just kind of sitting there on top of it. Um, hold, you know, it's doing some interception and, and just basically holding it there and letting it slowly work its way down into the soil as opposed to it just rushing into the soil. Um, it also can be reduced by water repellent soils. Um, although this really, the water repellent soils do really just initially reduce infiltration and eventually they'll, they'll give way, but it might take months or, 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 you know, a year to finally come by and get back to normal. And then also you can get, um, some pore clogging by the fine ash particles, um, these nutrient rich ash particles that are going to provide um, great things for the soil can also be somewhat of a problem if they clog up the pores in the soil. And so this picture right here, just the idea of we've got this litter and duff layer that's kind of holding holding well. So some stuff works its way into the um, into the groundwater. Some some stuff will um, will run off but really get held here on this hill slope. 
and you know it'll slowly run off but it won't go quick whereas post wildfire if you get a thunderstorm we're already getting um, less infiltration anyways because our lines are not as thickly drawn and instead we get this big overland flow because nothing is going into um, our soil layer here it's instead just all running off into our street which is very problematic in terms of evapotranspiration, or really evaporation and transpiration, evaporation increases after a fire, but transpiration decreases, so they have an inverse relationship post-fire. And that's just due to the idea that um, evaporation is increasing because you've got open areas, you've got that loss of shading and protection, so that's going to promote evaporation and, and just water back into the atmosphere. Uh, in terms of transpiration, you get uh, a decrease in transpiration because you got a loss of leaf area and the post-fire herbaceous plants do not um, root deep enough to promote transpiration. And so really, you're going to get this big, huge decrease in uh, evapotranspiration after fire. But eventually, once you start getting um, plants back on the site, you're going to get back and start approaching back towards those areas um, or the uh, the levels that you had uh, in terms of evapotranspiration before the fire as long as you get um, vegetation back on the on the area and then this just kind of shows again the idea of the herbaceous cover with our soil layer and then having one of those hydrophobic layers and not um, not being able to get this precipitation into our air, into our, our land and the problem that's going to cause. So uh, in terms of overland flow and hill slope erosion. So when we say overland flow, we're really just talking about surface runoff. So the idea of water just hitting the ground and then gravity taking it downhill, it not working its way into the into the soil, which is what we need because um, water gets stored in the ground and water gets stored in the soil and that's how plants uh, get their water and that's how we also get our water because a lot of our water comes from groundwater uh, as well as other freshwater sources like where this water is then flowing off to into the streams. Uh, if you want to pause the video right now you can and uh, click this link, it'll take you to a um, document about um, the effects of water quality um, and post-fire in Wyoming. Overland flow can be substantial post-fire. Uh, in Chaparral, it was 40% higher, and then in some areas of the Sierra Nevadas, it was um, a lot bit higher to a little bit higher, like, you know, um, 30% higher, but then all the way to like 2,000% higher. So depending on certain areas, depending on your topography, uh, depending on um, how hydrophobic your soils get, all of those different things, you can um, get huge problems with surface runoff, really increasing your amount of water quantity um, that enters, enters into the streams. And then that also, because of your um, increase in surface runoff, leads to problems with erosion. So fire renders landscapes more sensitive to erosive forces because um, there's really nothing there protecting these areas from erosion. So your vegetation and your litter, all these things that we're going to soak up water and let it slowly work its way down into the soil, these things that have roots into the ground, so holding, giving the, the soil like extra stability, all of that's all gone. So now the rain splash, the idea of wind coming and just pushing the soil and this overland flow all are increasing the uh, chances of erosion happening. And this type of erosion, um, if you take in class, class with me, we talk about geologic erosion, which happens um, over long periods of times, thousands and millions of years, but this is accelerated erosion. And this accelerated erosion begins while the fire is still burning, um, is when it first starts happening with the, um, 
the basically the the uh, wind created by the fire and then also you get a second flush with those first post fire raids that start leading to rills and rills are just micro channels um, kind of taking the sprinkler analogy again if you see an area where your sprinkler is just kind of leaking a bunch instead of spraying you'll see like a little channel develop and that same thing happens out in the wilderness but you can get a series of channels or a series of rills um, that that'll happen which could um, be really problematic in terms of erosion um, if you get your vegetation to start coming back and um, get annuals and perennials to start recolonizing the area it can return back to to normal in in a couple of years but that's if if everything goes the way it's supposed to uh, here's just kind of a look. Um, this is a sagebrush rangeland that was burned by the soda fire in 2015, 2015 in the Reynolds Creek Experimental Watershed in southwestern Idaho. And you can see with this topography and nothing much there to stop it. If you get a large rain event, all that water is going to channel um, right downhill into, into Reynolds Creek. And so it's, it's really important um, to understand this idea that um, there's no, fire doesn't really necessarily, you know, increase the water or, or the erosion, but if you get fire and you get this, um, precipitation event, then you can have real problematic, um, pro you can have just a real, um, uh, problems to deal with in terms of erosion and, and runoff. And so this uh, graph on the right shows the idea of in these unburned areas because you've got uh, roots, because you've got vegetation, and all these things kind of um, um, separating the water and kind of slowing it down, you do not have as big of an issue with, um, with runoff or erosion, even if it's a, a small storm or a big storm. However, when you get these burned areas, you can have really big problems, um, maybe not so much with low magnitude storms, but with even moderate to, you know, um, moderate high to very high um, magnitude storms. You get these really huge problems with runoff and erosion. Move myself out of the way there. Uh -huh. So water quantity, like I've said before, water quantity is increased uh, in terms of just that amount of surface water or overland flow. You're going to get more stream flow and you're going to get more downstream flooding. And this greater total water yield that you're getting can overwhelm streams. You get intermittent streams to become perennial. So if you don't um, remember that difference, so intermittent streams are streams that when it's rainy, they become filled up. When it's not rainy, they, they don't really have water in them. But those intermittent streams can end up becoming perennial streams um, because of just the amount of water that's now available to them. And they won't go back to intermittent streams until that water quantity decreases. Your peak flow, which is your greatest instantaneous discharge, and your storm flow, which is just basically a measure of your surface runoff, both are increased. And then not only is your water quantity increasing, but the time that it takes for your water quantity to increase is also decreasing because it's the water's getting to the streams quicker because nothing is there to slow it down. In fact, everything's there to speed it up. If you look at this graph on the right, this idea of post wildfire, right? You get increased runoff and potential for debris flow because there's nothing stopping all this stuff from making it down here into the channel before we had trees we had um we had uh litter we had biomass we had all these things in the way and now there's nothing to just stop the water from uh heading down into the stream and then also bringing um debris and sediment with it so in terms of our water quality um, specifically, we can see changes in water quality in turbidity. Turbidity is the measure of suspended solids and stream flow. And so our stream flows are going to be, are going to be full of ash and fine soil grain. So you just get dirty water, right? Water should look like this, but you're going to end up with this muddy, um, muddy, brownie, gross looking thing that's just full of ash and debris. 
uh, water quality, um, we're going to see changes in temperature. And that's an indirect change, but it's due to the idea that there's no um, vegetation providing for shade and um, protection. Um, it's not going to, there's nothing stopping the solar radiation from hitting the water now. And then you also get a change in stream chemistry. So the nutrients and soluble compounds in the ash that, um, that we want to go into the soil because they're going to help plants grow. Um, some, some of it's going to make it into the soil, but some of it's also going to just make it into the stream flow. And that nu the nutrients, while they may have been great for the soil, they might not be as great for the aquatic environment. And that's just, um, that's the, that's kind of, um, it's sad the way that, that, that works. That could work for one thing, but not work for the other, but that's just the way it is. Uh, if we get more nutrients and we get warmer water temperature, that can cause algal blooms, um, which we, we discuss um, in quite quite uh, big detail in terms of uh, the idea of eutrophication during natural resources class. But the idea that we can get these um, algal blooms or bacterial blooms, which are going to deplete the dissolved oxygen and, and basically make the, the area unlivable for, for fish and other aquatic um, organisms. Is just it's not great for the for the aquatic ecosystem. And then we also have to think about us too. So um, this graph specifically, or this image is talking about in 2012, the High Park fire burned large section of the Cache Lapooter uh, watershed, which is in uh, northern Colorado, and that forced the city of Fort Collins to shut down its water intake along that river and rely on alternate water supplies for 100 consecutive days. So remember, these areas and the whole reason forests were, um, were set aside in the first place was that they are our sources for water. And so if there are sources for water, we really want to protect them. We really want to make sure that they don't negatively affect our drinking water because they can if we end up having um, big enough fires that, that uh, make it hard for... Uh, for the areas that we get drinking water from to be able to to provide us that water and, and the the processes that go along with that. And then our third part. So we talked about soil, we talked uh, about water, and then air. And really with air we're talking about smoke and the residues of combustion. Um, big, big idea is that it can affect local areas or it can be transported miles away, but then also the idea it's going to affect human health, greenhouse gas emissions, um, budgets in terms of, um, like in California, we have CARB, which is the California, uh, air, um, air quality board, um, and, and then visibility as well. And, you know, leading to accidents or just, you know, ugliness, right? Aesthetically, it's not pleasing at all to have um, reduced visibility. So in terms of our air quality, um, smoke emissions come from, um, smoke emissions from fires contain a number of pollutants. So uh, it contains particulate matter, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide. Um, it contains um, volatile organic compounds. It also contains toxic pollutants. So in terms of the toxic pollutants, uh, we got acrolein, benzene, and formaldehyde. In terms of your climate, climate impacting gases or your greenhouse gases, you got carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and black carbon uh, in your smoke emissions. And then, um, to be honest with you, there's some of these things I understand um, really well. Some of them I don't understand really well and I don't really think we need to go into detail but the idea of just when you hear some of these things right some of them you're like well that's okay the majority of them are not really things you want to have entering your lungs right formaldehyde is what we use to preserve dead bodies that's not really something that I, I want to be um, entering into my lungs all the time carbon monoxide is you know too much carbon monoxide and you can you can get killed. So there's, um, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be able to tell you the difference between all of these things without doing a bunch more research, but just the idea that all of that is in smoke emissions and it's going to be a different mixture depending on where and 
what was in the fire and how long the fire burned and the intensity and all of those different things. But the idea that all of this is in those smoke emissions, it's okay if that's making its way into the atmosphere. It's different when it's just sitting in the valley for day after day after day and we're, we're the ones um, breathing it in. Um, one interesting idea uh, is that low intensity fires actually produce little buoyancy and can lead to smoke settling in valleys and lowland areas. High intensity fires produce high buoyancy, can lead to a fast rising calm and can actually get the, um, the smoke emissions higher up, which so you would think, well, that's, that's the better way to go. Well, it is and it isn't. One, um, is that yes, it doesn't, it doesn't settle into the lowland areas as much. But then the other part of that is though, then it might go miles and go settle in somewhere else. And that's how we get fires, um, burning in other areas that end up settling here in the, in the Central Valley, right? You get a fire burning up in the Sierras and um, tearing the Sierras up, but then all the smoke sits here. And so it's it's a good and a bad in terms of that um, high intensity fire. And so this uh, right here, there's a um, there's a website um, called um, I'm probably getting it wrong, but something like Purple Air, where it measures um, the amount of emissions in in the in the air in a given area so this is from uh september 11th of 2020 so september 11th of 2020 and you can see with the fires that were going on in california and oregon at that time what our air looked like on the west coast here even up into washington and up into canada and even down into mexico as opposed to other parts of the united states right no big deal even places like New York where, you know, people talk about the pollution all the time. Not so bad there, but we were seeing some crazy levels. Look at this, 573, right? Well, what's, what's your normal levels? Well, look at the majority of this stuff. 27, 13, 16, 28, 23, 16, 0, 1, 5, 38, 28, right? So those are more normal levels. What are we seeing? 573, 439, 429, 402, 309, 526, 613. Like just crazy numbers. 657, right? Ridiculously high numbers in terms of um, the our, our smoke and our air quality just being poor. Smoke also has um, an effect on the ecosystem. Uh, in terms of the ecosystem, can, it can reduce photosynthetic efficiency. It um, may protect from um, vegetation from fungal infection. So um, the idea of um, things like anosis root rot and other funguses trying to make their way in um, into uh, these areas that smoke uh, might actually prevent that from happening. Uh, it can also lead to the germination of annuals and some perennial species in chaparral ecosystems, and that's caused by chemicals in the smoke in charred wood. Um, you also get ozone um, that's produced in smoke and, um, and also in urban pollution, and that can reduce photosynthetic rates. It can reduce fo foliar chlorophyll, and it can accelerate foliar senescence. So if you say to yourself, oh, I'm not quite sure what you said, well, let's make it simpler. Ozone, bad stuff produced in smoke, also produced in pollution, reduces photosynthetic rates. So the how quickly leaves can take energy from the sun and turn it into sugar and energy, reduces foliar, foliar chlorophyll, so it reduces the amount of chlorophyll within the plant, which is the things that uh, that exist so that the sun can, um, so that the, the plant can do photosynthesis and take the energy from the sun. And that's also going to accelerate foliar senescence. And senescence is just the idea of um, moving towards being useless, basically, is the simplest way to say it. The leaf, the leaf doesn't necessarily die, but the leaf just will not be producing at a fast rate. Think about just the idea of growing old, right? 
Um, when you're younger, you can do a bunch of stuff. When you're mature, you're, you're peaking and you can do a whole bunch of stuff. And then eventually you get to an age where you can still do some stuff, but you're not really as active as before or accomplishing as much as possible. And that's the idea of this foliar senescence. You're not, the leaf's not going to die, but it's not really doing much as compared to before. The other thing you get is atmospheric nitrogen deposition near urban areas. Um, so we talked about that before with the idea of, um, of nitrogen, a fire burning up that nitrogen and, and then, um, a fire burning up that nitrogen and helping out these urban areas because they already had too much nitrogen. Well, now, also with smoke, if you get smoke to sit there, you might get a, a deposition of atmospheric nitrogen, which is also going to then contribute with that urban pollution into making some of these areas more habitable for non-native exotic species instead of native species. So, you know, there's, a, once again, another one of those plus and minuses. And so, um, just summarizing the whole thing, there really is a total ecosystem effect when we're, when we're talking about, um, fire and the physical environment, right? And I found this graphic and I think it summarizes it pretty well in terms of the whole ecosystem, right? So you get this fire happening. You get a big fire. There goes our greenhouse gases up into the atmosphere. We might get um, the smoke right here, right? And the smoke, um, can, is, it's creating air pollution. It's increasing aerosols. We're getting some black carbon deposition up here. Um, we got a fire, so we've, we've burned out this area. So now we're getting some post-fire debris flow because we've got in um, this rain, um, this rain event. The erosion is going to then change the topography. Of this area we're getting some soil erosion down here with these micro channels that then be the rills and the micro channels which then become these bigger channels which then can lead um, to to erosion down here and maybe because um, with some change in the temperature plus um, plus all this uh, extra sediment and nutrients we're getting some algal blooms over here we could end up with some post fire um, flooding in this area but we're also going to get some good stuff. We're going to get some, some re-sprouting happening. Um, we're going to get some nitrogen deposition, which could be, which is really good for the most part. It could be bad if it's next to areas that already have too much nitrogen deposition happening. Um, we'll get some phosphorus deposition. There's going to be, um, things popping back. So that'll lead to some herbivory and you're going to get some sediment deposition. There's a whole bunch of different things that happen within the ecosystem because of fire. There's a whole bunch of things that happen in the ecosystem that lead to fire or don't lead to fire. And so we know that fire can have positive effects and negative effects. So the big question then becomes now, how do we manage fire and how do we use fire to make sure that we're getting the best of it and not a lot of the worst of it? And if we start thinking about the majority of the things that we talked about, there's there's definitely um, fires definitely okay, but big huge fires don't seem like they're going to be very good to us, right? We don't want a fire that burns the whole hillside because then there's no um, there's nothing here, and so we get this rain and we get this big huge debris flow and we get all these nutrients going in, right? Basically when we think about the worst of that happening, it's when we're thinking about these big, huge stand replacing fires. Now that happens in some areas and that's just the natural pattern, but the ecosystem is more used to that. It's these areas that the ecosystem isn't used to that, that you can get much more of these um, problems happening. And whereas low intensity fires, um, quick moving low intensity fires, um, where we're, we're kind of just cleaning up the ecosystem and we're not creating this big, huge, just moonscape that can lead to all these problems. That's going to be much more effective. And so those are the types of things you want to think about as we really keep studying fire. And that's all I got.